one way to alleviate the moral hazard that is created when ROI is used internally to evaluate the performance of managers of investment centers would be to use residual income instead. Unlike ROI, which is a ratio, residual income is a subtraction problem. It's the difference between the actual profit that's generated by an investment center and the opportunity cost of the capital that was invested in that division. In other words, when the firm chose to give capital to this division, it gave up the chance to use that capital for something else. Therefore, we would expect that the division would do better at generating income from the capital than the capital would have generated if it was used for some other purpose. In other words, this measures the extent to which the division has enriched the firm through its operations. The formula for residual income is the difference between after-tax income and something called RRR times the divisional assets. After-tax income is the measure of profit and this term represents what the firm is giving up because it gave these assets to this division instead of using them for some other purpose. In this computation, RRR is the required rate of return. What return does the firm expect the division to generate on the assets at the division's disposal? Now, choosing the required rate of return is a tricky issue. Some firms use what's called a hurdle rate. It's called a hurdle rate because divisions or projects have to jump that hurdle. It's a rate that is chosen by the division, usually to meet the expectations of the board of directors and the shareholders. Alternatively, a firm could use its opportunity cost. That is, these resources came from somewhere. They came either from debt financing or from equity financing or a combination of the two. Therefore, the firm could use the cost of having these assets as the measure of the minimum return that the firm would expect this division to generate. Let's look at Health E. In the previous section, we found that the treadmill division manager faced a moral hazard because the division's ROI was lower with the expansion than it was without the expansion. So the treadmill manager would choose not to expand. Let's see if the same thing is true if the division manager was evaluated based on residual income instead of ROI. In this case, Health E has a 10% required rate of return, either because that's what they need in order to make the board of directors and the shareholders happy, or because that's the cost of capital for having these assets. Without the expansion, the treadmill division's residual income would be the difference between the income that it generated and the required rate of return times its invested assets. 
in this case, the divisional income is greater than the required rate of return, 10% times the divisional assets. Therefore, the division has a positive residual income of $507,000. In other words, having these assets and using them during the period to make treadmills has enriched the firm as a whole by $507,000 dollars after considering the cost of capital. What about the expansion? Residual income is usually measured based on after-tax income. We already knew the after-tax income for the free weights division and the treadmill division because that was given in the previous section, but we have to compute the after-tax income for the expansion itself. We were told that the expansion was expected to generate $1.7 million in income. If we subtract out 30% tax rate, that tells us that the after-tax income from the expansion would be $1,190,000. Now, we can compute residual income for the expansion by taking the after-tax income and comparing it to the 10% required rate of return times the $10 million of additional invested assets that would be required for the expansion. And when we do that, we find that the expansion itself generates $190,000 of residual income. If the manager of the treadmill division decides to invest in the expansion, we can figure out the residual income for the treadmill division after the expansion by combining the income that the division already has with the additional after-tax income that it expects to generate and comparing that to 10% times the combined assets. And when we do that, we find that the residual income with the expansion is significantly larger than it was without the expansion. Now, the moral hazard has gone away. The treadmill division manager would want the expansion because the expansion has positive residual income. In other words, the project jumps the 10% hurdle set by the firm. And the division would end up generating more residual income with the expansion than it would without it. What would the firm want? In order to compute this, we have to determine residual income without the expansion by adding the income from the free weights division to the income from the treadmill division and then comparing that to 10% times the combined divisional assets. And when we do, we find that overall, the two divisions enrich the firm by $567,000 after considering the cost of capital. We already know from the previous slide that the residual income generated by the expansion itself is $190,000. We can compute the residual income for the firm for its entire operations plus the expansion by adding in the effect of the expansion to income and the effect of the expansion to assets. And when we do, we find that our residual income is bigger. The firm would want the manager 
to invest in the expansion because it enriches the firm as a whole. And the reason that it does is the expansion itself has positive residual income. It generates more income even after considering the cost of capital. It makes the firm wealthier. Using residual income instead of ROI to evaluate the treadmill division manager has alleviated the moral hazard that the manager faced and has created goal congruence. Every time a project jumps the hurdle and generates at least the required rate of return or more, it will enrich the division and it will enrich the firm as a whole. Therefore, the division manager will make the choice that the firm would want them to make. There are several strong advantages to using residual income to evaluate the managers of divisions within the firm. One reason is it takes into account the firm's minimum rate of return and it will only give a positive value for residual income if the project or the division jumps that hurdle, generates more income than the minimum amount that the firm requires. Because of that, managers will accept any project that has at least the required rate of return and they will reject any project that doesn't jump the hurdle, that doesn't generate at least the required rate of return. However, residual income does have some disadvantages. One disadvantage may be that it does not consider the size of the divisions, and that's true because it's a subtraction problem, not a ratio. However, the size of the divisions is implicit in the calculation of the hurdle. In other words, we multiply our required rate of return by the division assets in order to determine the minimum amount of income that the division must generate. The other problem is more serious. Sometimes firms choose an unreasonable required rate of return. They choose a wishful rate. We would like all of our projects to have an 18% required rate of return. Well, that's lovely, and of course we'd all like that very much. The problem is if a firm chooses an unreasonably high required rate of return, they may say no to projects that would have been profitable for them, that would have covered their cost of capital and then some. And shareholders would probably want the firms to say yes to those projects.